You're listening to 94.4 FM Salford City Radio, the Friday Sports Show. You're listening to Salford City Radio, 94.4 FM, the Friday Sports Show with your host, Jimmy Petruzzi, bringing you news from the local area and around the world. We bring Salford to the world and the world to Salford. The aim of the show is to increase participation and awareness in different sports, but we also are very fortunate, we, we, as well as interviewing some of the world's best athletes, sports people, people who work in sport across a wide range of disciplines, um, trainers, coaches, um, journalists, you name it. We've interviewed so many different people who've given us really, really interesting insights to their field. We also have a segment interviewing some of the world's most influential people in the field of psychology and related fields, giving us an insight into what their thoughts are. In, in, in mental health and psychology. They have really interesting guests today. Um, we're going to interview a broadcast journalist who's a broadcast journalist at Five Life Sport, who no doubt is going to give us a really interesting insight into what it's like to be a broadcast journalist. So, Katie Jones, welcome to the show. Great to have you on board. Hello, how are you? Very good, thanks. Thank you uh, for having me, first of all. Thank you for having me. No, it's great to have you on board. And it's always interesting to get different insights into the world of sport. Katie, so we sort of start with yourself. How did you get into broadcast um, journalism? What sort of what was your inspiration to go into the field? The main thing is that I love sports. I've always loved sports. Um, I grew up in a family that were obsessed by it. Um, my dad, my brother. I spent a lot of time with them growing up. Um, my brother was ten years older, but always kind of looked after me. Um, and the pair of them would always take me to watch Manchester City and um, I just loved sport from an early age and it was every sport it was darts, mm. snooker I would I could watch anything um, but where I grew up, I grew up on a council estate um, in the High Peak and mm -hmm. there wasn't really many opportunities to be honest, it was um, you know, nobody ever thought that you could do something like this mm. um, and most of my family had worked factory jobs and a lot of them had never finished school let alone go to like university or college or anything um so i kind of wanted to be the one the kind of first mm -hmm. one that could do that mm -hmm. um there was a lot of pressure to go into like law because i was mm -hmm. um i was i worked hard at school and i was quite naturally clever in a way I was good at exams and things like that and everyone was like oh law is the way for you to go but mm. I never it never really appealed to me I always wanted to do something in sport because I loved it so much mm. um, and it was quite growing up very male dominated mm. and I kind of wanted to, to change that a little bit and prove to people that you could do some, something different you know something that Absolutely. you really wanted to do yeah, that's absolutely really uh, in an you know, inspirational journey for you there, uh, Katie. I think that's you know really interesting, and, and no doubt our listeners sort of tuning in will be sort of yeah, well, inspired in, in one sense, really, how you sort of managed to, I mean, you could say is a probably more unconventional road to, to sort of to doing what you do, albeit if there is any, any road, but generally we kind of associate, you know, people, um, you know, it's, it's not an easy industry to get involved in, but your passion certainly I'm sure had a, had a big hand in sort of you getting to where you are and what would you say some of the, you sort of alluded on some of the challenges to, to sort of get to where you are and can you sort of yeah. give us a bit of an insight into what are some of the challenges you can get, you mentioned there sort of, you know, the, the sort of male dominated world in, in, in that sport in that sense but what are some of the challenges that you sort of, you've, you've sort of um, came across yourself? In trying to get in in the first place, it's 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 a lot of kind of what not what you know. Sometimes it's who you know, mm. and I didn't know anybody who did this kind of thing. Mm. So just trying to get a first foot in the door was really really difficult. Um, so I basically got a job after uni at 21 just a nine to five and then started kind of just banging on people's doors mm. and like sent you know being a little bit cheeky mm. and putting ideas to people and asking if I could help so I did a lot of volunteer work at first um locally so I worked for like high peak radio and you know yeah. the local newspapers and things like that um that was always the biggest challenge just trying to get a foot in the door and it's almost once you get in there 
then that opens so many opportunities because you're around so many people mm. who do many so different jobs and your face is there so if an opportunity pops up you know, you're there in an office or wherever you're based and you can kind of grab those opportunities but if you're not there physically it's really hard to do that mm-hmm. so the the main challenge was just trying to get get in there but like I said I was a little bit cheeky and just approached mm-hmm. people like mm-hmm. my very first job was I needed to get a job after uni so I approached Manchester City and was like you know you don't have any like writers who work for you who mm-hmm. who are fans or who are female mm-hmm. um so I was like you should re- let me let me write a column for you and they they were kind of like no you know it's too close to the start of the season mm-hmm. you know send us some stuff we'll we'll consider you for next year I sent them some stuff and they were like right we're going to take you on this season you know will wow. send us the first two issues and we'll go with you and that was just from having an idea and seeing a little gap mm. and being cheeky enough to go and kind of ask for it mm. so I would say that is that is the main the main struggle I had was getting in there because like I said I knew nobody mm. who who did this sort of thing so you know it's trying to find the contacts and obviously this was when I left university it was back in 2007 mm-hmm. so things like have advanced a lot since then and mm. you know, things that you become aware of like social media and you know different platforms that you can contact people on and mm. you know we're, we're much more tech savvy now than kind of were back then um, so yeah that was the massive struggle and what was it like for you when you sort of got your foot in the door with City obviously you know you, you sort of were a fan and you're passionate about the club and I mean, what was it? I mean, it was an interesting time, I think, at City at that point because, you know, they're sort of going through their sort of trials and tribulations and eventually land on their feet. But what was it like to be involved sort of writing um, at City at that point for you, Katie? Just sort of interested to know, really, what the experience yeah, was. Yeah, it was, it was incredible, to be honest, because, you know, you, you go from being a fan mm-hmm. and, you know, watching them every week and then everything kind of turns you watch things and you see things from a different angle I always say that um you you have to try and keep your passion and your kind of that fan inside you you have Mm. to keep that because you can very easily lose it because you see it from a very analytical point and you know Mm. it becomes very much sort of the job for you um so I think it's important that you kind of hold on to that Mm. but it was really interesting you know getting to you know speak to and interview these people that you kind of watch from afar Mm -hmm. um and it was just it always has always felt and it still feels like a massive privilege to do Mm -hmm. the job that I do because although it it has its challenges and you know things that are that, that are really difficult that come with it I always try and remember that so many people would love to do this job Mm-hmm. And although I've I have worked hard to get there, you know I have been very lucky, and I I just remember that every day. A lot Brilliant. of people would love to do this job. We're very very privileged. Absolutely no, and so speaking of city there, um, Katie sort of brings back memories uh, when um, well years ago at, at, at Salford occasionally sort of I'd go down and, and do some of the interviews and and they'd sign a a manager, an Italian manager called Manchini, <laughs> and uh, yeah, it was just, it, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was it. That was really fascinating because it's like it, you know, it was like the the sort of start of the something big, really, and and, and you just sort of yeah. felt the the atmosphere. I remember sort of someone mentioning at um, uh, Salford Radio saying, "Would you like to go down?" And to me, Mancini was like a um, well, I. You know, Italian football I grew up on, and 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 I sort of really yeah. admired him as a footballer. I was like, here, here I am. <laughs> I should have asked him questions in, in in the little Italian I know. So stick to English, or, you know. But I mean, but the point I'm getting, did you ever felt like? I mean, you know, you strike me as sort of, uh, you know, your, your sort of roots, as, you, you're a grounded person. And do you think that sort of growing up in the environment you're in kind of has kept you grounded when you're interviewing people? Uh, you know, I know that you've interviewed yeah. some huge people. Do you kind of think to yourself, okay? As much as I admire these people, like, th- there's nothing to be overawed about. They're just like anybody else, really. Yeah, definitely. And I think that's really important, important, important thing to, to remember. And I think when you do treat 
you know, the sports people that you come across, when you treat them like human beings, because they are human beings mm. just like the rest of us, when you treat them like that, I think they respect that. I think when you, so week in, week out in work, when you're, you're working with former sports stars and current sports stars, um, they you want them to feel comfortable with you and, like, it's a safe space to, to be around you and things mm. like that. And I think treating them... You know, when they when they go outside in in the in the world normally, you know, they do get you know, not I don't mean hassle, but they get a lot mm. of attention, and mm. you know, you want that to be kind of the opposite when they're with you. And I've always found that if you try and just connect with them and speak to them on a human level, then you always usually get the best out of them as well. Mm, mm, absolutely, um, yeah. that's when you get the best the best interviews and the best programs and things like that. But it was, um, I think. From the, like my background and my family, they've always kept me grounded, and mm. I've always had this, you know, inside. You might have a little excitement when you see a certain person or a certain player that you loved growing up. Um, for me, when I was younger, it was when I was really like watching City. It was like Darren Huckabee, yeah, like my yeah, favourite yeah. player, and I remember wow, the first yeah. time like I um, interviewed him when I worked on a program called Blue Tuesday for BBC Radio Manchester. And inside, I had this like excitement, but kept thinking that you know just you know be professional mm. um, because your reputation is huge within yes, within, within this and you know it, it sticks and you're always wanting to maintain that but um yeah I remember that you talk about Mancini I always remember he smelled so incredible <laughs> and he'd walk into a room he'd walk yeah. past you and he always looked impeccable like yeah, he was yeah. impeccably dressed yeah. and he always smelled amazing I think we saw that like side of that again in the euros in yeah. the summer um but yeah it's um it, it's kind of surreal my, my family are so proud and they love it because they're all massive sports fans you know they they, they always ask the question like who's the most famous person's number you've got on your phone or who you met this week and and they they love that and that's when you remember that's like you know, wow, I'm doing this amazing job. Because um, you do sometimes forget when, you know, you get caught up in, you know, the long hours, like everybody does with the job. Mm. So, yeah, it's, um, always remember that. Absolutely. No, that's, that's really interesting. I'm, I'm, I'm sure our listeners, uh, especially the ones who are sort of considering going into sort of broadcasting and journalism, also, you know, take note that, you know, they are long hours. It isn't easy as well. And also, I suppose, in saying that too, we sort of you mentioned a really interesting point there about the sort of the sports people where they are sort of human too. Although there's been a couple of the athletic ability makes me wonder really, um, you know, at least well. But 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 you know, from a personality point of view, it, it must be difficult for them too at times. I mean, I know people listening thinking oh, it's a it is a privileged position to be an athlete. But I suppose what I'm getting at is the day and age we live in now with social media, everyone sort of wanting to come up and sort of take a selfie and all these sort of things that sort of go on. And do you sort of sense that in your time that sort of things have changed with social media, with sports people? Uh, okay, do you think that sort of maybe the attitudes have changed a little bit in, in, in the world of sort of social media that we have now where, you know, you, you probably don't get the sort of privacy that you might have got before? Yeah, definitely. I think everybody now is very aware as well, um, and you can you can sense a fear in some people sometimes, you know, um, about what they say, and you know, fear of things being taken out of context. Mm -hmm. So you can work with like people that they can be quite guarded. So that's why you do have to like really build that trust with them and let them know that you know, I'm not going to like try and trip you up or anything like mm -hmm. that because as soon as they say anything, that just spreads like wildfire it's all over social media mm -hmm. you know people people do love to take things out of context and create a headline mm -hmm. and that is a worry for a lot of people um so you definitely definitely see that difference but you, you also have the positives of it mm -hmm. as well in that you can feel connected to somebody you know in a way that you never could before you know you can follow someone on you know instagram and like a photo and they might engage and you know leave a comment and they might reply and so i think it's great in that respect that you know they feel that they can speak to fans and in a way give their true opinions and their true feelings a bit more but then mm. on the, the other hand yeah I do think you you come across people that are quite guarded and you, you know now that a lot of people are media trained mm. so whenever we start out with people we will always give them media training 
if they're going to start as a pundit or you know reporter or anything like that you know having come from you know their sporting world you kind mm. of help them and you know clubs nowadays as well and I'm sure you know in, in all sports you know mm. you, they kind of advise current and and ex you know athletes on how to deal with that kind of thing Absolutely, because the yeah. scrutiny they're under like oh my gosh I could the thought of having to deal with that is just mm. just immense I mean you know mm. I, I would always be careful about what I put put out there but mm. theirs is a thousand times absolutely thousand times more. absolutely no no I, that's a really great point Katie for sure and sometimes and, and then on top of that sometimes things don't come out in the right way I mean if someone puts a tweet out sometimes it can get misinterpreted as well so you know you yeah. only got so many words so to speak in in, in these sort of things and, and and basically yeah I can see how um, it is sort of uh, imperative but I suppose you know the takeaway there is for, for, for listeners is that you know like anybody else you know they, they're only human and they're only making their way in the world and, and, and they're doing the best they can and I think in saying that sometimes I think what doesn't probably get uh, as many column inches is, is when they do um, you know like they're going to sort of children's hospitals and do, do that sort of thing and yeah. you know at, at times I, I mean I, I know performers Katie that sort of you know they don't even mention it that they go and do those yeah. sort of things. There's no PR. They just generally, you know, do it for for, 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 for the desire. Do you sort of get that sense sometimes that we don't, you know, may, maybe don't hear the other side of things as much as we sort of could do? Or maybe people just aren't sort of interested in that side of the, the, the game? Um, times like at the minute, like we've had Christmas and everything, so yeah. you get to see it a little bit more. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but I think, you know, a lot of, you know, sporting outlets and people that cover sport, um, good or bad, everybody has an agenda. In, not saying that it's always negative, but, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. whether it's to, you know, get clicks or whether it's to, you know, get listeners or create uh, yeah, buzz. Yeah. So everybody is always looking for that, that angle and that thing to talk about. And it's not always usually mm. the... the the positives that, that get those things yeah. but, um you know whether it's you know a young player going on a night out or you know and you know something like that they, they, they would rather talk about that and you know mm, small things mm. can become very big things mm. um but yeah it's um it's definitely something i think it would be great to see more of and i think having you know when people have their own social medias and things like that i think it's good for, for putting that stuff out there um Mm. But no, it's um, it's been nice to see it at Christmas, like as um, even with COVID and things like that. I mm. saw like all the the um, the Liverpool team, you know, visiting via Zoom yeah, and things yeah, like that. It, and, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and I think that's good. I think that's good for the players as well to re- yes. to remember, you know, and it's sort of a distraction for them. You know, they have pressures like the rest of us, and mm. you know, for them to get to do things like that, it keeps them grounded as well. Mm-hmm. Because um, I think we forget that. You know, they have this ama- we see that they have this amazing life, but it can be quite lonely for them when you mm-hmm. speak to people. Mm-hmm. You know, they they have a very set, you know, routine. They go to training, they come home, you know, they have a lot of things done for them, mm-hmm. you know, when they're travelling. And it's quite a lonely life sometimes. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think when they get to do things like that and show their personalities more, because, you know, we get to see that they're not robots, you know, mm-hmm. you know, when people are giving them stick on the sidelines and shouting at them and then, mm-hmm. you know, then you see, you know, that they are real people. That's why I think the documentaries recently have been great. You know, we've mm-hmm. seen um, the ones with like Spurs and yeah. Man City and the you know, old behind the scenes things. Absolutely. I think that's really good for for revealing that human side of them absolutely um, yeah. yeah no that's a great point i'm sort of glad you mentioned that um you know for our listeners and sort of you know watching these sort of documentaries and i certainly do and i really enjoy them and it sort of shows uh, a different side and and you know obviously it's very you know, privileged life to be a professional sports person footballer it's, it's a great life uh, and you know many of them have earned that they've got there they've worked hard to get there and sort of good luck to them but equally of all I mean everything get, comes with its inherited problems I guess you know as much as it's hard for people to believe I suppose no matter who you are in life you're going to have things that are on your list um, but that's not undermining obviously I think you know we've seen around the world people uh, experiencing a lot of challenges 
as well. So sometimes I suppose as well, Katie's probably, you know, what's going off off the, off the pitch really in the world we live in can sort of, you know, people sometimes obviously, sport is, is almost like an escapism, I guess, for people, yeah. you know, so that you can lose yourself and enjoy it and sort of, you know, yeah. And in terms of your own memorable moments, now that you had plenty of memorable moments, that's for sure, um, what would you say for you, what's sort of been your highlights and memorable moments, Katie? When you think back, I think it's always the first, you know, the first times of things. So I remember, um, obviously, when I, my very first gig, like, writing for Man City, I was the first, you know, female fan columnist and the mm. only one in the Premier League. That That is that has a special place because wow. that kind of kicked everything off. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'm just as proud of when I worked for High Peak Radio. We did a, yeah. a show called Football Fan Time yeah. where we covered local teams like Glossop, New Mills, wow. Buxton. And we got to, Glossop got to the FA Vars final. Wow. So I got to go to Wembley and cover that. And that, that sticks out. Um, and then in terms of when I, I started working for Five Live Sports, I've been there like, what, 10 years now. Um, London 2012, my first Olympics. That always mm-hmm. sticks out. Um, the very first special program I ever produced. So we have you have your you know day to day programs. Yeah, you, know, you cover a lot of Premier League, and you might be preparing and producing um, a commentary or a discussion based mm-hmm. program. But you also create specials where if you've got an idea of a topic or you know something, a conversation that's going on within society that you can kind of explore. Mm-hmm. And my very first one of those was called Body Beautiful. And Mm -hmm. that was back in 2012, and it was about how female athletes are treated differently Mm -hmm. because of their body shape. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of a conversation that was sort of brewing at the time. So that has a special place because that was the very first um, kind of one of those programs I did, Mm -hmm. um, which we involved like Jess Ennis, who was... the the, you know the poster girl at the time at the exit it was London 2012. Um, the Euros this summer, England getting to the final, something I never thought I would get to cover. <laughs> yeah. um, that was huge. Um, and then more recently, um, I got to do a special all about Sergio Aguero when he left the Premier League. Um, so I would say it's all that usually the first, but I yeah. love my memorable moments. I love going to the OBs, we call them, the outside broadcasts. Um, so it's when you are not in the studio, you're out at an event, covering the event from, from that angle. So mm. it could be you go to you know, the Open, to the golf, and you get to be there, and you know, you're you're following the players around and covering it that way, or yeah. you know, you're to Cheltenham Festival for a week. Those are the things that really make the job you know, so special, because you get to be at those events, and mm. that's when you realise, like, what, a, what a, like a position you're in yeah. to be you know be walking behind Rory McIlroy as he's walking the course and you know, things like that those are the things that will forever stick in my memory and absolutely uh, yeah. are just so special so special and, and no doubt many more to sort of come that's for sure and it's really interesting you say I mean you, your time at High Peak uh, Radio Katie what I find interesting there is you sort of mentioned like Glossop and you know for me. Um, I mean, I help out a little bit at a team called Bake Up, as, as, as sort of <laughs> many people probably know. And but th- there's nothing more, you know, great than sort of going there, you know, when I can and throughout the season, just seeing him play. That, that semi-pro football is just incredible. It's just the experience is yeah. phenomenal. You just you feel so welcome there, and it's a great vibe. It's you know, it, it's what the word family club really means. In, in your own experience, sort of being involved in that sort of non-league, do you think that sort of you know, being around that sort of passion and, and, and you know, the, the, the sort of the hardcore of football, really. Has that been a big influence on your sort of career in terms of sort of, you know, being in, in and around the non-league environment where sort of, you know, the, the, the passion is just immense for the game and, you know, it's just an incredible place to be, really. I think, you know, a non-league ground on a Saturday afternoon and it's a great place to be. Do you think that sort of influenced your career as a broadcaster? Definitely. I think that... It, that non-league side like I used to go and watch when even when I was very young and I'd get to go and watch Man City and things like that I'd still go and watch our local teams mm-hmm. and that is the passion that's where you feel it because yeah. you and you and the access that you get at that level 
Mm. It's just incredible. Like the higher up that you get within the football leagues, everybody is much more protected, mm. and mm. it's much more difficult to get to get in there. And you know the access is very limited. But whereas, like, if you go into cover gossip, you become friends with the manager yeah. and friends yeah. with the players, and you know they want nothing more than to get you know get themselves on the radio mm. or you know to, to get their teams out there and things like that um so it's just a completely different feel and you do feel that passion because you know a lot of people are volunteering and mm. you know the you know community run clubs and people do it for the love of the game mm. and you know we we can't deny that you know for example sport is a business now mm. for for a lot of people and it's you know when you get back down to that that side of it it's not it's still very much mm. done to the love of everything mm. and I think um it's just like you say everything about it you know you go to the game like you're the fans are right on the pitch mm, and you know yeah. they can I, I know that they can you know you can hit players can hear things from the sidelines at a Premier League mm, game yeah, or something yeah. but yeah. not to the extent that you could you could there and you just yeah, it's it feels very much more yeah. family esque when, yeah, when you're there. Because uh, the higher up you get, you kind of you lose your team. I think that was one of the biggest things. A little bit when all the money got invested into Manchester City, you know, it was incredible to think, wow, we're going to actually compete now. Mm. You know, compared to like the days where I watched them in Division, the old Division Two, yeah. um, and you think with that you kind of feel like you're going to lose mm. the access and lose that team a little bit you're not going to be mm. have the same sort of input and mm. I feel as much of a part of it so yeah so definitely I think um like you say local football um is always something I still love going now I still go now like I've got friends who play you know for Glossop and you know if you go to Hyde United and things like that and, yeah 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 um I still love to go. Um, yeah. Like I said, because a lot of it now, I don't get to go to a lot of football. That's like outside of work. It's it's such a shame. Like I have a yeah, season yeah. ticket at Manchester City. Yeah. Very yeah. rarely get to go. Very yeah, rarely get yeah, to go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I can imagine. Absolutely. And it's only so many hours in a day, and and you know, like life's plans and work, and absolutely, that's for sure. You know, but I think what you said there, you know, that's sort of for many of our listeners, and and I, I suppose you know, in Southwood, we, we're sort of we're quite fortunate in the sense that, you know, there's so many sporting establishments in, you know, in and around the area and such a sort of proud sporting team. And I've said this before that I remember sort of years ago, um, Katie Southwood, the, the, the local team uh, here, um, was my first stint at Bay Cup helping out, just doing a bit of coaching there. And Southwood were in the same league and, you know, life plans and sort of work and, and everything else and sort of left to do other things but sort of going back and, and looking what, where Southwood are and but obviously you know sort of the investment into the club and no doubt has helped them get to where they are and and, and like he says it you know there is the business element to it too and I suppose you know it's one of them it's, it's, it's the way the game is the evolution of the game I mean do you sort of yeah. do you, do you, from your experience so sort of, I, I know it's probably sort of outside um, your remit but just from your experience sort of being on the ground, do you sort of see the game continuing to evolve in terms of like investors and people coming in? And I mean, how do you sort of see the game going from from this point? From a, from that from a you know we sort of see Newcastle with the investment there, and yeah. do you sort of see it continuing that way? Or I think everything um, it just feels like everything is building. You know, you're always waiting for the next big investor mm. to come in, and what club it's gonna it's going to go to I think I my biggest worry is that I think with, with, within the Premier League alone like you don't have to even look at you know the championship downwards there is a massive gulf you know from the top to the bottom mm. um, so that is my kind of only worry I, I do see it going that way I do see mm. you know more clubs being invested into but obviously that just widens that gap mm. um, and you know, that's the biggest fear that it just won't be as competitive. You know, you'll have those, that top section mm. and then that bottom section that will always be, you know, fighting relegation up and down. Mm. Um, so that is obviously the fear that comes with it. But I do see it going that way. And I think more and more now, 
investment is going into sort of other areas mm. i think um the women's game is obviously mm. taking a lot more investment yeah um and that's you know a great thing to see and you know clubs kind of um you know making you know it used to be that you had a men's team and you wouldn't even know if you had a women's team sometimes mm. um whereas now they're more sort of joined up and more as one um so I think that can only be a good thing that comes with it. Absolutely, um, yeah. But yeah, but I do. It, it, it's a worry, but I do see it, it going, it going more that way. You mm-hmm. know, I think the Premier League, especially, is such a huge brand and has so much appeal across the world mm. that you know investors want want a piece of it really mm, absolutely yeah and that's a great point for sure and, and I, I suppose like all things i mean there's been a, a lot of positives with the investment at certain clubs we've seen like he says a knock on effect through the women's game and also infrastructure and 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 we've seen sort of you know in and around the area as well so there are positives yeah, but manchester city have regenerated absolutely yeah you know the area around there mm. and invested in the community and things like that yeah. so it does have all those positive aspects to it as well absolutely you know that's for sure but you know that's just that's, that's life is it i suppose things sort of never stay the same and in terms of yourself i mean if anyone so i know it's difficult impossible to give any advice or you know everyone's on their own journey type thing but anyone yeah. sort of listening sort of considering going into broadcast journalism and you know listening yeah. to you sort of speak and you know you sort of mentioned uh, you, you know, giving us an honest, open account of your experience, how you got to where you are, and, and sort of what it's like yeah. to, to work in the field. What would you say, you know, to some, or maybe it's like a, a younger self, if you were starting out, if you could speak to younger self getting into it, that might be a better way to sort of to frame it. What would you say, Katie, going into it? What are some sort of tips that you would say? Um, I would say be prepared for long, unsociable hours because mm-hmm. it is an unsociable job because you're working other people's social time. So it's a lot of evenings and weekends, and that is it's sometimes it's disheartening because you know you'll be working when your friends or your family or every or everyone are getting together. Mm-hmm. So I'd say be prepared for that, um, for the, the kind of unsociable hours. Um, but with that, you know, it comes so many amazing opportunities mm. and um it's a, a an amazing place um like area to work in mm. so yeah be prepared for the long hours i would say um i would say you don't ask you don't get so be proactive mm. you know go out you know try and volunteer get work experience wherever you can um and you know whether that is at a local radio station like you said or a newspaper mm. or you know a football club whether it starts as volunteering and just going and getting in there and I would say do that as early as possible you know if you're if you're Mm. studying at the minute you know try and get in there now Mm. um because it's so competitive and there's so many people that want to do it um so nobody's ever going to give you anything Mm -hmm. so you need to, to go and get it yourself so yeah be proactive volunteer as much as you can grind get that work experience but know your worth as well you know you know people will want you to work for free forever mm. sometimes so yeah, it's yeah. you know know that it's, yeah. it's a difficult balance and i would just say be nice because like i say you know your manners and cost you nothing you know if you're nice to people when you're building your way up there you know you come across people throughout your career and your reputation is everything Mm -hmm. so I started like I say in local radio then I went on to local BBC radio and then moved up to like network radio national radio and I still see now all the people I work with in local radio and you know you always need a favor from someone Mm. and we always help each other out and you know if you pick up the phone to someone who's after a favor and they're really rude to you Mm. you're going to be less likely to help them and I think being nice costs nothing and it'll get you much much further Mm. um so yeah, I would. That was it. Work hard. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Be proactive. Be a little bit cheeky. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Just, no, no, brilliant. And, and stay, uh, gro- stay grounded. No, brilliant. That was really, you know, really, really interesting uh, for sure. And and uh, you know, I'm sure our listeners, uh, well, particularly anybody, really people who are considering going into the the field but even if they're not sort of considering going into the field sort of that's you know some really good points is really uh for anything i mean regardless of what profession you do i think sort of being 
uh, you know, a decent person and, 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 and um, you know, going out there and sort of extending that comfort zone every now and again is, is a good, you know, good thing for, for anybody really sort of in any profession. But it's been great speaking to you sort of, um, Katie, your passion for the game certainly shines through and, and uh, you know, we wish you all the uh, very best uh, for the, um, you know, rest of the season and, and beyond. So thanks for joining us on the Friday Sports Show, Katie. It was great to have you on board. Um, thank was, you so much for having me. Thank you, Katie. It was Katie Jones, uh, broadcast journalist at uh, Five Wise Sports, who was kind enough to join us and, and share her experience, um, her journey so far that no doubt has, you know, uh, many, many uh, good moments to, to, to come along. But it was Katie Jones on South of the City Radio, 94.5 FM, the Friday Sports Show with your host, Jimmy Petruzzi.